Hi everyone. Um, I just figured we were reading Gregor the Overlander. I know it's backwards because I've got my video going. Um, but now that we're not in school together, you might still want to be knowing what's going on in our story. So what I've decided to do is I'm going to be reading one chapter and um, posting it. So if you want to still listen to Gregor the Overlander, you can. I am, we were on, let's see what chapter, we were on chapter seven. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the beginning of that chapter, and I'm just gonna read this chapter aloud to you. So um, it is gonna be a little bit of a, oh, rewind, because it's been a while since we've <laughs> heard the story, but uh, I'll be reading each uh, chapter to you. So this is chapter seven. The darkness pressed down on Gregor's eyes until he felt it had physical weight, like water. He'd never been completely without light before. At home, street lights, car headlights, and the occasional flashing fire truck shone in the tiny window of his bedroom. Here, once he'd blown out the oil lamp, it was as if he'd lost the sense of sight entirely. He had been tempted to relight the lamp. Merith had told him that torches burned all night along in the corridors outside his room, and he could rekindle the flame there. But he wanted to save the oil. He'd been lost, he'd be lost without it if once he got out of regalia. Boots made a snuffling sound and pressed her back deeper into his side. His arm tightened around her. Servants had prepared separate beds for them, but Boots had climbed right in with Gregor. It hadn't been hard to get the underlanders to excuse them for bed. Everyone could see Boots could barely keep her eyes open, and he must have looked pretty ragged himself. He wasn't. Adrenaline pu was pumping through him so fast, he was afraid that people could hear his heart beating through his he the heavy curtains that he'd shut off their bedroom from the hall. The last thing he could do was sleep. It'd been, he, they had been invited to bathe again before bed. It was something of a necessity for Boots, who had, in addition to stew, conditioned her curls with some kind of pudding. <laughs> Gregor hadn't objected either. The water gave him a quiet place to think about his escape plan. It also gave him a chance to ask Dulcet about the water system in the palace without seeming suspicious. How do you guys have hot and cold running water? He asked. She told him the water was pumped from a series of cold and hot springs. And then it just empties back into the spring? He asked innocently. Oh no, that would not be fresh, said Dulcet. The dirty water falls into the river beneath the palace and then flows to the waterway. It was just the information he needed. The river beneath the palace was their way out. Even better, it led to the waterway. He didn't know what that was exactly, but Vicus had mentioned it had two mentioned it had two gateways to the overland. Boots stirred again in her sleep, and Gregor patted her side to be quiet. She had not seemed to miss home until bedtime, and she looked worried, and he told her it was time to go to sleep. Mama, she said, Lizzie? It was, was it only that morning that Lizzie had ridden off to camp on the bus? It seemed like a thousand years ago. Huh, Mama, insisted Boots. Even though she was exhausted, he had a hard time getting her to sleep. Now he could tell by how restless she was that she was having very vivid dreams. Probably full of giant cockroaches and bats, he thought. He had no way to tell how much time had passed. An hour? Two? But what little noise he'd been able to hear through the curtain had stopped. If he was going to do this thing, he needed to get started. Gregor gently disengaged himself from Boots and stood up. He fumbled in the dark and found the sling Dulcet had given to him. Trying to position Boots inside proved tricky. Finally, he just squeezed his eyes shut and let his other senses work. That was easier. He slid her in the sling and the pack onto his back. Boots murmured, Mama, and her head fell against his shoulder. I'm working on it, baby, he whispered back and searched the table for the lamp. That was all he was taking, Boots, the pack, and the lamp. He needed his hands for other things. Gregor groped his way through the curtain and pushed the edge aside. There was enough torchlight from the far hall for him to make out the passage was empty. 
The underlanders had not bothered to post guards at, the, at his door. Now that they knew him better, they were making an effort to make him feel like a guest. And anyway, where would he go? Down the river, he thought grimly. Oh, whatever that leads. He crept along the hall, taking care to place each of his bare feet silently. Thankfully, Boots slept on. His plan would disintegrate if she woke before he got out of the palace. Their bedroom was conveniently close to the bathroom, and Gregor followed his way to the waterway sound. His plan was simple. The river ran under the palace. If he could make it his way to the ground floor without losing the sound of water, he should find the place it drained into the river. If the plan... If the plan was simple, its execution was not. It took Gregor several hours to weave his way down through the palace. The bathrooms were not always near the stairs and he found himself having to backtrack so he wouldn't lose the sound of water. Twice he had to duck into rooms and hide when he spotted underlanders. <clears throat> there weren't many about, but some sort of guards patrolled the palace at night. Finally, the sound of water became stronger and he made his way to the lowest level of the building. He followed his ears to where the roar was loudest and sniffed through the doorway. For a moment, Gregor almost abandoned his plan. When Dulcet had said river, he had pictured the rivers that, threw, that flowed through New York City. But this Underland River looked like something out of an action adventure movie. It wasn't terribly wide, but it ran with such speed at the surface that the surface was churned into white foam. He couldn't guess how deep it was, but it had enough power to carry large boulders as if they were empty soda cans. Hmm, no wonder the Underlanders didn't bother to post a guard on the dock. The river was more dangerous than any army could they could assemble. <sighs> but you must be able to travel on it. They have boats thought Gregor, noticing half a dozen crafts tied up to the rush of the current, above the rush of the current. <clears throat> there they made some kind of skin stretched, they were made of some kind of skin stretched over a frame. Hmm, they reminded him of the canoes at camp. Camp? Oh, why couldn't he have just been at camp like a normal kid? Hmm. Trying not to think of the bobbing boulders, he lit his oil lamp from a torch by the dock. On reflection, he took the torch as well. There, where he was going, light would be as, an import, as important as air. He blew out the oil lamp to save fuel. He carefully climbed into the boats and checked it out. The torch slid into a hole they clearly designed for it. Hmm, how did he get this thing down into the water, he wondered. Two ropes held it aloft, meaning up. They were attached to a metal wheel that was tied to the dock. Well, here goes nothing, Gregor said, and he gave the wheel a yank. It gave a loud creak and the boat fell straight into the river, knocking Gregor onto his rear end. The current swept up the boat like it was a dried leaf. Gregor grasped the sides and hung on as they shot into the darkness. Hearing voices, he managed to look back to the dock for just a moment. Two underlanders were screaming something after him. The river curved and they vanished from sight. Would they come after him? Of course they would come after him, but he had a head start. How far was it, how far was it to the waterway? What was the waterway? And once he got there, what would he do next? <clears throat> Gregor could have been more, would have been more concerned about these questions. He wasn't trying so hard to stay alive. Along with the boulders, he had to dodge the jagged black rocks that jutted out of the water. He found an oar lying on the bottom of the boat and used it to deflect the canoe off the rocks. The temperature of the underland had felt comfortably cool since he had arrived, especially after the 90 degree heat of his apartment. But the cold wind whipped off the water, gave him goosebumps Gregor, he thought he heard someone call his name. Was it his imagination or? No, there it was again. The Underlanders must be closing in on him. The river swerved and suddenly he could see a little better. A long cavern lined with crystals shimmered around him, reflecting back his torchlight. Gregor made up a glittering beach, flanking one side of the river up ahead. 
a tunnel from the beach into the dark. On impulse, Gregor pushed off a rock and pointed the canoe toward the beach. He paddled desperately with the oar for the shore. Staying on the river was of no use. The underlanders were breathing down his neck. Maybe he had time to pull up on the beach and hide in a tunnel. After they'd passed by, he could wait a few hours and then try the river again. The canoe slammed into the beach. Gregor caught himself just before his, hit, his face hit the bottom boat. Boots jerked, partly weak, and cried a little, but he soothed her back to sleep with his voice as he struggled to pull his craft across the sand with one hand while carrying the torch with the other. It's okay, Boots. Shh, go back to sleep. Hi, Bat, she muttered, and her head plopped up, back down on his shoulder. Gregor heard his name in the distance and sped up. He had just reached the mouth of the tunnel when he ran head first into something warm and fuzzy. Startled, he staggered back a few paces, dropping the torch. The something stepped out into the dim light. Gregor's knees turned to jelly and he sunk slowly into the sand. The face of a monstrous rat broke into a smile. That's chapter seven. I'll see you for chapter eight.